Okay, there's a lot of people here. Uh, all right, I'll just start. What do you want to be when you grow up? Mrs. Henderson asked. Clara's palm shot into the air and waved back and forth frantically. I leaned forward and listened hard. Last year, I'd been just about to go down the slide when she tapped me on the shoulder with nails painted pink and sparkly, her charm bracelets jingling in my ear. A giggle was hiding on her lips. I heard high-pitched laughter and saw Clara's friends watching from the swings. I spun around, cross-legged, and looked up at her. What? I'd asked stupidly. She leaned down slowly and pressed her lips against my cheek. Mid-kiss, I felt her lips twinge into a smile, but then she pulled away and ran for her friends. I want to be a nurse, she now chirped excitedly. That's wonderful, Mrs. Henderson thrilled. And what about you, Jonas? She stooped low in front of me, hands on knees, so our eyes were level. Her eyes shined into mine and illuminated my thoughts, which scrambled to hide from her all-powerful gaze. I looked around the room. An alphabet and a number line twisted around the walls like vines, cartoon drawings branching off like vibrant leaves. Every desk was stuck with a guide to cursive, swirling letters curling across the shiny paper. Childish graffiti stamped the walls with messages of varying encouragement and enthusiasm. One poster in particular caught my eye. A man in a puffy white suit looked just like the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man, with a bubble for a face and a massive tube on his back. He was floating among thousands of stars that seemed to twinkle despite their entrapment within paper. Planets surrounded him, spinning reds and whirling blues and rings around them that curved with a kind of beauty I could not begin to describe. A sun glowed brilliantly from behind, rays of magnificent light illuminating the silver and white folds of the spacesuit and glinting off its shiny gadgets. I imagined myself inside that marshmallow suit, somehow breathing within the black vastness of space. Stars would be like lit candles in the distance, flickering. I would be like Han Solo from Star Wars, with a pistol at my belt and a spaceship to explore, getting into brash firefights with a Wookiee at my side. Or maybe I'd find myself strong with the Force and build my own lightsaber. I'd travel across the galaxy to bring peace to peculiar places and defeat evil Sith Lords. The galaxy, the journey, the stars and the world and the aliens, the impossibilities, the possibilities. I sat slumped in my hard plastic seat with wide eyes that surely reflected the galaxy in front of me, and I stared at the poster just above Mrs. Henderson. Then my lips pulled themselves apart and mumbled, I want to be an astronaut. Mrs. Henderson's smile grew, but no matter how wide her smile became, her eyes showed the truth. It's important to have big dreams when you're a child, Jonas. I looked down at my lap where my hands twisted into themselves nervously and closed my eyes and saw the black of space in my eyelids. I listened to Clara's pencil scratching against her paper. Mrs. Henderson moved on to the next kid in our row. But Mrs. Henderson, I can become an astronaut, can't I? I asked. Mrs. Henderson stopped and turned back to me, her lips pressed tight together. She seemed to be thinking of the right response to my question. Finally, she kneeled in front of me, her eyes even closer to mine than before. Jonas, it's very important to have big, beautiful dreams. But Jonas, her eyes drowned me in her pity. Dreams don't always come true. She stayed there for a second more, wondering if she should add anything else, and then she stood and moved on. That night, I stared at my star-strewn ceiling and thought about what Mrs. Henderson had said. I turned and looked out the window, admiring the stars, the ones that were twinkling and sparkling in the distance. They were literal light years away from me, and when I reached my hand out, my fingers could only delicately caress the impossible distance. My hand fell back against the soft bed sheets, and my eyes fell upon the star-shaped stickers on my ceiling. I pushed blankets away and piled pillows on top of each other until, when I stood on them, I'd created an elevator to the stars. I scraped the stars away one at a time and they fell, glowing, scattered across my bed in absolute chaos. Then I'd, when I'd erased every one, I brushed them off my bed and laid my blankets and pillows where they were supposed to go. I fell asleep dreaming about the stars, but when I opened my eyes, the ceiling was clean and blank. Every night, dreams cassetted across my eyelids, shooting stars streaking past, spaceships zooming through asteroid belts, strange creatures with crazy cultures. There were thousands of planets I explored, but every morning the blinding sun burned them away. I went to school and collected books, collected knowledge, and built a wall of solid reality against the intrusion of fantasy. What good was fantasy, a lousy dream, if it would never even come true? Years passed by, and I grew taller and taller. I gathered maturity, earned money, learned and learned and learned about what the world contained. Clara and I became friends, better than friends. We laughed about the day she kissed me on the playground, and Clara always assured me that it was fate that brought us together. What are you going to be when you grow up? Clara asked me one day. 
We were sitting up against the solid brick of the school, letting the sun heat our faces and the brick cool our backs. She leaned her head against my shoulder and I tipped my head back against the brick, examining the fluff of the clouds, the gradient of blue stretching across the horizon. It was a picturesque scene. I could smell flowers blooming and felt the beginnings of a sneeze. Dandelion puffs floated on the wind. Distantly, I heard the schools of children from a playground nearby. I took Clara's hand in mine and pointed up at a cloud. What does that one look like to you? It looks like a telephone, you know, one of those with the curly cord. Where she saw a curling cord, I saw the antenna of an alien spaceship. Where she saw a phone, I saw the body of the ship. Floating nearby it were tiny speckles of cloud that could easily be life forms from the ship. Rethink the telephone, I said. Doesn't it look like a spaceship too, I wondered. She tilted her head to the side and squinted. I suppose so, she agreed. I continued to watch that cloud, even as it distorted into a jumbled mess, collapsing in on itself and reinflating it into, into an entirely different shape. When I tore my eyes away, I saw Clara looking at me with a knowing look on her face. You'll always want to be an astronaut, won't you? She inquired. Of course not, I denied. I looked back up at the sky where stars would emerge as soon as the Earth tilted far enough to escape the wrath of the sun. Stars I will always dream of, stars I can never reach. She pulled away and sat cross-legged in front of me so that we were eye to eye. Why do you refuse to admit it, she asked. You're always dreaming of the stars. She reached a hand forward to caress my face, but I stood up abruptly. My dream is the dream of a little kid who wanted to become his own Han Solo. But dreams are just dreams. They don't change life as it is. In any way, dreams don't come true. I looked longingly up at the sky, behind which the impossible stars hid infuriatingly from my view. I can't reach the stars, Clara, I whispered. Yes, you can, she assured me. Clara stepped closer, her braceleted arms crossed in front of her like a freckled bow tie. You've been reaching stars your entire life. There's an entire galaxy bundled up inside your head, fast and endless and limitless in its possibilities. You have planets full of thoughts. I've explored so many of them, seen so many unimaginable creatures and blossoming plant life and impossible possibilities roaming across every single one. There are spaceships traveling from one to another, making connections and intricate trade routes, and all the while there's you, using your own force of will to fabricate it all. Don't you see? But that's all stuck inside my head, I said. The real ones are the ones that matter. You can't reach those, you're right, she confirmed. Then she lightly pressed the tip of her index finger to the space between my eyes. But you can reach what's here. She pressed the same finger to the space between her own eyes. And you can reach what's here. At the touch of her fingers, the wall I'd built to protect myself from what was impossible was falling apart, brick by brick, romance to accept what I was and what I was not, to accept what the world was and what it could be. When the lid came off, when the wall fell down, I found that I wasn't scared of my dreams and my ability to achieve them any longer. I realized that I was a dream, that every single person was limitless in what they could accomplish, inside their heads and outside too. But it all started on the inside, and the steps one climbed to acquire a dream were just as important as the dream itself. I looked up at the sky and saw clouds and infinite blue, but just, as, but just in front of me was Clara, a galaxy all in herself, a fathomable dream. Okay, I'm going to just be blown away all night long. You know, I haven't heard these yet either, and I was a little worried, and now I'm not worried at all. This is fabulous. Thank you. Wow, I'm excited. Okay. Um, Megan Demuse is next. 